I'm Joy Morris, inviting you to listen to True Stories of the Wild West, hosted by C.R. King, a production of R.K. Enterprises. Hello, everyone. C.R. King here. Well, today we're going to talk about the death of Morgan Earp, who was the younger brother of Wyatt Earp by three years. So, are you ready? Here we go. Morgan, again, was three years younger than, than Wyatt. He was the third member of the trio that was commonly called the Fighting Earps. The Earps were a close-knit family. They gravitated to law enforcement. Morgan was the prettiest, the funniest, the most carefree, and the least conservative of the three. But he was as deadly as they come when necessary. Morgan's law enforcement was extensive. He had been a deputy sheriff for Ford County. He worked under Sheriff Bat Masterson. This was in 1876. He was a policeman in Butte, Montana in 1879. He was back as deputy sheriff of Ford County in 1880. And after his arrival in Tombstone, which was in March of 1880, Morgan worked on and off as a deputy sheriff, a posse member, a special deputy policeman for his brother, Virgil, who was the current chief of police. The rest of the time, Morgan worked for Wells Fargo as a stagecoach guard. Three months after the gunfight near the O.K. Corral, on March 18, 1882, Briggs Goodrich, the lawyer to the cowboy faction, approached the Earps, and he warned them of upcoming fights and trouble. Wyatt Earp made the statement, I think they're after us last night. Do you know, do you think we are in trouble, he asked. Yes replied Goodrich. You are about to get it in the neck. That's a quote. Goodrich was delivering the message on behalf of Johnny Ringo, who wanted nothing to do with the upcoming problems. Later that day, while Morgan and Wyatt were walking down the street, they were past Florentino Cruz and Indian Charlie. Wyatt pointed them out to his brother, and he said, Be careful. Keep an eye on them. I hear that they've been making, or talking about making trouble all about town. Tired of hiding ever since his brother was a attempt assassination on Virgil, he decided to go to a comedy at Shefflin Hall. It's the name, Stolen Kisses. It was a two and a half hour show, and it was on for only two days. So, oh, by the way, Shefflin Hall is located above Fremont Street on 4th Street. Doc Holliday and two others were there to help to protect Morgan. And again, as you're leaving, he was approached by Goodrich. And Morgan did not heed the warning. For he had decided to go with Bob Hatch to play some pool. So off they went to Campbell and Hatch's Saloon and Billards Hall, which was located on Allen, near 4th Street. So Goodrich, again, around 10.30 that night, tried to warn him again. Well, that didn't work. But he had been sitting on his balcony overlooking the town, and he saw two men running parallel to Morgan. He knew that he was being stalked. That's why he went back and found Morgan and said, please. Inside the saloon, there were several men besides these two. There was Sherman McMasters. He was a, a family friend. Dan Tipton, also a friend. Both of these men were there to protect Morgan. Wyatt Earp showed up because he was concerned about his brother. And he was sitting in a chair 
that was against the wall to the card room. Now, he was keeping his eye on his favorite brother. Meanwhile, Tipton was a few chairs down, and there were other men in the saloon. A guy by the name of Patrick Holland, who was in the card room. And there were others sitting around the old stove pipe in front of the building, across from the bar, engaged in laughter and drinks and having a gay time. Morgan, having lost the first pool game, started the second. Bob Hatch was positioned at the rear of the pool table near the corner with his back facing the rear wall. Morgan stood approximately 12 to 18 inches to Hatch's right, watching Hatch line up his next shot. Morgan was not more than four feet away from the rear wall in a doorway, which, which was made of glass panels, mostly painted over with white. Two shots rang out. The first hit Morgan. The second missed Wyatt's head by only a few inches. Morgan collapsed, blocking the one and only doorway, which led directly out back. It took the men eight seconds to run out the side door and down the alley to the back of the building, but there was no one there. The two shooters were gone. George Barry was sitting near the wood stove in the front of the building. That bullet, when the shooting occurred, the bullet which entered Morgan's body was just above his waistline. An accident at a slight downward angle, traveling another 30 to 40 feet, striking George Berry in the thigh. He collapsed, but his wound was not serious. Morgan, on the other hand, his wound was very serious. The bullet passed through his liver, above his waist. It cut into his kidney. It cut his spinal column in two, and he was hemorrhaging. His hemorrhaging was great. Wyatt tried to pick up his brother. He cried out in pain. Wyatt finally dragged him towards the card door, card room door, where doctors were summoned. They examined him, and they announced there was nothing they could do, for Morgan will pass away within a few minutes. With help, Wyatt picked his brother up. He moved him to the couch inside the card room. Morgan remained quiet throughout. But at one point, he said, quote, I have played my last game of pool. He requested that his legs be straightened out, and they were. Virgil and his wife, Allie, James and his wife, Bessie, Warren and the, the youngest brother were all summoned. Virgil was still weak, and his wife helped him. Morgan Earp died. It was just 20 minutes prior to Wyatt Earp's 33rd birthday. Now, contrary to what the movies show, Wyatt didn't go bananas, he didn't cry, he didn't, he just stood up. And he walked out without a word, turned and walked into the darkness of the night. What did he do? Well, that night, he went and made arrangements for his brother's burial. He took care of the family affairs. He hired the undertakers, Ritter and Ritter, to handle Morgan's funeral. He contacted his parents and said, no, bring the boy home, the rest, which he agreed to do. Morgan's body laid in the lobby of the Cosmopolitan Hotel early that morning until, until 12.30 in the afternoon. And then his coffee was loaded into a wagon, and as reported by the tombstone epitaph, the funeral crusade pulled away from the cosmopolitan. The fire bell tolled out the tune, earth to earth, dust to dust. Everybody, that was the death 
of Borg and Earp. But there's a lot more to this story. And if you want to know the full story, then get the book, A Fraternity of Gunslingers, True Stories of the Wild West Gunmen. It's in the first volume of two volumes. Check it out. It's on Barnes & Noble or Amazon. You can get it in paperback or electronic format, Kindles. In time, I'm going to do the podcast about the Vendetta Ride, aftermath of the assassination of Borg and Herb. And of course, the attempted assassination of Virgil. Until then, it's Christmas. I'll be back after the holidays for a new episode. Be safe. Merry Christmas. C.R. King here, signing off. Stay tuned for next week's tale.